after playing this piece, what stays with you is this kind of yearning, emotionality of it, and the, the cry, and and just just anguish and and beauty. It's a very very beautiful piece. I had such a great time chatting with today's guest and learning about Polish music and composers and so many great topics we covered today. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. We are chatting today with Pavel Knapik, who is a bassist and composer living in New York City, and he recently performed the American premiere of Tadeusz Kasern's Double Bass Concerto. This is a fascinating piece. It's written in a different kind of tuning that we're used to. Pavel and I talk about that and much more. His background, his compositional background, Tadeusz his life as a diplomat, quite a path, a lot of sadness and heartache and this path that we talk about. And Pavel has actually filmed a documentary about the life and times of Tadeusz and his time in New York City. Really interesting. And we have that all linked up in our show notes. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dario Strings, Steve Swan String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Modacity, A440 Violin Shop, Colstein Music, and the Sheet Music app, Encoda. More on them later. But let's dig into this conversation and feature a bit of Tadeusz's bass concerto as performed by Pavel. Well, it's funny. You're, I, I think I've, I've talked to a, a little over 600 people for the podcast. You're the only the second person from Poland I've chatted with. Uh, and the first person was Marek Romanowski, who's this wonderful, uh, uh, fairly young uh, soloist and teacher. And he came in. Uh, he was one of the prize winners for the Bratisage solo competition in 2017. But it was fun to fun to catch up with him. If you don't mind, let's start just with a little bit of your backstory, because I know in addition to being a performer, you're a composer, and can just just talk a little bit about where where you grew up and maybe your years that eventually led you to New York City. Okay, so uh, I spent the first uh, quarter of century of my life in Poland. Uh, I grew up in Wrocław, uh, Poland, which uh, uh, in itself it's kind of a, a base mecca, if you will. Because we we had um, uh, a marvelous opportunity to hear and host an uh, amazing range of soloists from all over the world, uh, including uh, you know uh, Gary Carr and and all all the big names came to play in in our beautiful uh, city of Wrocław, and that's where I met my uh, I would say. Uh, one of the biggest inspirations in terms of double bass, and that was uh, my professor, uh, whose name is Tadeusz Gurny. Um, uh, he uh, he was uh, an incredible virtuoso of the instrument, and I heard him play um, Sensan cello concerto on the bass, and that was it for me. You know, that was uh, that was a breaking point. Um, then I heard his uh, other uh, pieces uh, that he played, recordings, and, and I finally met him in person. And that, that was it. You know, I, I thought of different instruments, but, but that meeting uh, changed everything. And he actually came from a, a legacy of Russian school of playing because his teacher um, uh, is Rustem Gabdulin. And Rustem Gabdulin... Um, is um, like he actually this month he he just retired as a principal bass of Russian National Symphony, and he was he he's an enormous presence there and and as a pedagogue as well as a performer, uh, also had multiple recordings with orchestras. Uh, fantastic uh, person and and he taught uh, master classes in Poland, and so forth. So a lot of that tradition got sort of. Um, uh, passed on to my playing and the way I, I see uh, um, things. But, um, you know, at the same time, but also being this kind of hub for for bass, we got exposed to all the amazing Western uh, uh, players. And that, that's just that's just fantastic. Um, and then 
when I graduated from the conservatory in Wrocław, I received several offers uh, of uh, scholarships in various places, but one of them came from New York. And that was always my dream. I, I kind of always um, uh, thought about New York and, and to some extent even thought of myself as a part of this. And, and that was that was something incredible that happened at that time. Um, I got a scholarship from the Kosciuszka Foundation, which is a Polish foundation uh, since 1925. So they will be uh, celebrating their... Uh, 100th anniversary very soon that is always promoting Polish culture in the United States and vice versa bringing Americans to Poland to study um, uh, culture, history, music whatever program you name they have it it's a big uh, it's a big organization I'm sure they have a chapter in Chicago as well um, and I came here and I uh, commenced my study at Manhattan School of Music, where I studied with uh, Timothy Cobb, Oren O'Brien, and I also studied uh, uh, with uh, Eugene Levinson. So, so that was my second master's degree, which they offer in a very unique and, and uh, interesting program called orchestral performance, where you uh, basically study um, uh, the the repertoire for the orchestra, you get an opportunity to play mock auditions, which is very helpful. And at the same time, it's a little bit different from, from the European model, where people um, uh, tend to be trained sort of with uh, ambition of becoming soloists. So it's like a, fo a focus on, on being soloist. Um, and, you know, we all know that uh, it's a very small percentage of of people in any instrument that will become soloists. So, so it was very good for me, that comprehensive second approach from orchestral side. Yeah, it's it's interesting that that difference in approach has always fascinated me. And uh, I, it's funny, I was I was just emailing back and forth with Oren O'Brien yesterday uh, uh, about uh, I don't even remember what it was about. I think it was about the n the numbering position system of positions and stuff. So uh, what a, what a great bunch of influences and in Tim Cobb and Eugene and all that. And when did uh, when did composing come into your life? Did you always write music or wh when did that happened for you that started in early 90s um when i was learning more and more repertoire for double bass somehow i realized that uh that there is a limit to it you know there's a limitation and, and maybe in a kind of uh, naive youthful way i started writing because i thought you know i want to write more uh, pieces for this instrument i want to play something that that resonates with me more that I kind of um, absorb from other instruments and, and other genres and I want to do something to enrich the vocabulary for, for double bass so, so I started writing pieces um, I wrote a piece uh, called Humoresque for double bass and piano and that was premiered uh, live on Polish radio in 1992 um, and then um, I wrote a bunch of other pieces, uh, and among them there was a Wrocław Concerto for Double Bass. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I basically drafted that piece uh, in 1993. Uh, I was in love, you know, I wanted to kind of commemorate everything and celebrate. Um, and then I put it aside. Um, and it was when I came here, you know, after four years, uh, we had 9-11, the tragedy of 9-11. And, and I realized, you know, I have to finish this because, you know, we might be gone anytime. It's, it's just so uh, delicate and frail, everything in life. So I finished the piece and um, I got uh, a, a beautiful big group, uh, award uh, from uh, the uh, New York-based Arthur Foundation. And that allowed me to to work through it and uh, orchestrate the piece and, and and build the score for it, and um, and so I premiered the concerto in Carnegie Hall in 2005 in June uh, with my pianist Peter Papievsky, uh, and then 
the full orchestral version was premiered uh, in 2012, where I actually, for that particular occasion, I, I founded an orchestra called Orchestra 54. You know how it is. It's, it's best to do it by yourself rather than wait for, uh, uh, for an opportunity. So, so you generate those things by yourself. It's quicker. And uh, so we premiered the whole uh, orchestral version in uh, May of 2012 at the Mena Center for Classical Music in New York. Wow, that, that's 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 incredible. Um, did you had you orchestrated? I've got a bunch of questions about that, and I, I do want to dig into uh, what you contacted me about. Certainly, uh, but but um, did you did you do any orchestration before that? Well, I um, I actually. Uh sort of privately studied uh, all those aspects with several composers and, and back in Poland I started with Grażyna uh, Pstrokońska Navratil who is a, a, a famous contemporary Polish composer uh, but also when I came to the United States I, I discussed this uh, piece extensively with uh, composer Richard Daniel Poor mm -hmm. as well as uh, David Noon so those uh, those wonderful people uh, helped me tremendously in, in putting all this enormous effort for me uh, together and, and so that the, the end result is, um, is what it is. And I invite you to uh, see and hear it on my YouTube channel, which you can find easily just by Googling my name. Yeah, and we'll we'll link up to that, and and also, uh, so and again, my uh, my I'll need help with pronunciation, but uh, Tadish, uh, this composer, t just say it for me, and then I'll I'll write it down and I'll practice. <laughs> oh, Tadeusz. Tadeusz, okay. Tadeusz, yeah, it's actually the same name as Kościuszko, mm. right? So mm -hmm. it's Tadeusz um, Kasern. Is that that's the composer that you are uh, asking mm -hmm. about, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Buying a double bass is a challenge for sure, and it's not getting any easier. That's why it's so great that Colsteins is offering interest-free financing and select instruments, bows, and instrument repair purchases. Learn more at Colstein.com, and while you're there, check out their wonderful selection of pedigree instruments and bows and everything else that they have to offer. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Did you know that you can tell the difference between D'Addario Strings by the silking? Peg and silking denotes pitch and tension. So E is green, A is black, D is yellow, and G is red. C, by the way, is purple if you have a C string. A thin band of yellow just before the metal winding denotes light tension. And a thin orange band of silking denotes heavy tension. Ball and silking, that's the stuff down by the tailpiece, denotes string family like Kaplan, Helicor, or Zyax. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. They proudly offer the the largest variety of fine bases and bows in the Southeast. You can find something at every price point by makers such as Thomas Martin, Bill Lakeberg, Romano Solano, Lemur Music, all Shen models, K, Epiphone, and bows by Louis Morizot, Fuchs, Nuremberg, Arcos Brazil, and others. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at bassviolinshop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. And 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 you've got and, and again I'll link up to all this, but you've got it's really cool. You've got this uh, two part YouTube uh, uh, video series, and the first one you're walking around and just and what a fascinating person. I, I started uh, uh, googling him and reading about his life on Wikipedia, and then you of course talk about his life, which is uh, fascinating, and there's a lot of tragedy 
and I mean, just talk about going in all these different directions. And then he's a composer on top of that. Uh, maybe just and then and then the second video you're performing this bass concerto of his, which is a marvelous work. And and it's like this. I love finding on dis- what I think of as undiscovered treasures like that, whether it's in a chamber orchestra or a solo bass piece or something like that. So maybe just talk about uh, his life and your discovery of the work and just it's a really cool project. Well, Jason, to be perfectly honest with you, I uh, I had the the score for that piece, the piano score, and, and the bass part for years. I had it. I acquired that uh, back in Poland simply from the library of my conservatory, and uh, and I had it. I looked at it. I, I I thought, wow, what a cool piece! I would like to play it one day. You know, maybe when I get through my studies and and everything. And then already here, one day, I uh, came across some information and I started looking deeper into, in, into his uh, story and, and him as a, as a human. And turns out that he came to New York City, Polish composer, writing music for double bass, finds himself in New York City. And, and that just hit me. You know, I, first of all, I never uh, heard a a performance of this piece. And then this information is brought to me. So, so it's like, uh, you know, things are aligning in in some kind of magical way. And so I uh, basically learned the piece and I knew of of his story. He came to uh, New York City in uh, 1945, right after the end of the Second World War in a capacity of a, of a diplomat for Polish government. And uh, he actually, uh, at first, was a cultural attaché for the consulate uh, of Republic of Poland in New York City. And then he was uh, promoted to the position of consul general. But in 1948, he, uh, he was uh, called to, uh, to go to back to Poland and the, just the harsh communist reality in that country made him realize that he cannot be a part of this anymore. So on the spot, kind of, he quit everything. He uh, he was even commissioned to write an opera uh, for children by the government, which he also, uh, you know, released himself um, of. And, And basically when he quit his job as a diplomat, he was also a lawyer, a pianist, and a composer. So it's a very multifaceted, phenomenal uh, individual. Uh, they erased him from the books. They, as a, you know, to punish him for his decision, uh, they basically uh, uh, expelled him from the, um, the Polish Composers uh, Society and, and did everything to kind of basically uh, eliminate him. And he lived here for... Um, number of years after that, uh, uh, playing uh, the piano and teaching at several schools. He taught at uh, New York University, he taught at New School, and he, he taught at uh, Third School, uh, Third Street uh, School Settlement. And, you know, the, the tragedy of, of his existence come, comes in a, in a place where he was not able to actually uh, establish himself as an American because he was considered... And that was the McCarthy era here. He was considered a high profile uh, communist official. So his uh, um, applications for um, citizenship, for asylum, for, for all of that, it was all denied. It was he was rejected and he was kind of in between. And, and that brought him to desperation of, of the level that that he basically tried to commit suicide. He was, uh, he, he took some pills, he was uh, found by his wife and, and resuscitated and uh, he was revived. And then things started to pick up a little bit for him. You know, he got some commissions. Uh, he was working with his um, uh, students, um, teaching composition and, and reworking some other works for other people, um, uh, also some theatrical works for Broadway. And in the end, he was on the way to be granted the, the citizenship and 
and at that point, unfortunately, he discovered that he's suffering from, from pancreatic cancer. And he passed away in 1957. So when all this came uh, together, and, and I realized that we are in the year 2017, which commemorates the double anniversary. The concerto was written in 1937. So um, we have 80 year anniversary of the concerto. And then we have uh, uh, 60 year anniversary of his passing in New York City. I, I thought I have to do it. I have to play this piece, m give an American premiere of it uh, for this New York composer. Uh, I know that he attempted through his connections with Juilliard uh, to have the piece performed. But, you know, first of all, it's written in baritone tuning. Mm -hmm. So that was already a, a, a major uh, um, um, obstacle and a hurdle that people didn't want to, um, you know, jump over because you have to commit your instrument for a long period of time to learn this piece. It's a very difficult uh, piece that is, you know, extremely uh, expressive and, and emotional and obsessive also in the way that uh, I, I think like Elgar Cello Concerto, you know, it gives you this, it's, it, it changes you. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't believe that he ever succeeded in, in having a full performance of the piece, uh, even in a, in, a, in a classroom at Juilliard because of the baritone tuning. And there were stories of breaking strings because people didn't have the properly manufactured high C string, which, you know, now even is kind of uh, rare, but, but you, can, you can get it. So it, it's possible. Um, and so that double anniversary, I, I went through, I gave two lectures, um, lecture performances that were part of that premiere at uh, New York University with my wonderful pianist, Marilyn Nonken. And then, uh, which was kind of important to me, I brought this piece to the Polish consulate where he used to work, where he used to be the consul general. And, and, and I also gave a, a performance of that, which, which is the one you can see on my YouTube channel. Uh, preceded by some, uh, some mini lecture about him. And, and that was just so moving and meaningful and, and, you know, one of the highlights for me. Wow, that that that's that's fascinating, and the piece is uh, the learning of it. The piece might have been quite an experience, and that's interesting. So baritone tuning, uh, I know what you're talking about, but that's the ter that's the term for it. So that would be with the C, your your tune C G D A, right? So, oh, so why on earth did he write in that tuning? That's that's fascinating to me. Well, you know, may perhaps he wanted to uh, make it more lyrical more give it more singing quality you know maybe emulating the, the voice mm -hmm. and bear in mind that he wrote a beautiful concerto for voice and orchestra and where the voice is not singing the the uh, words actually but just giving the kind of coloraturas and beautiful voices treated as an instrument so he had that quality in him from before maybe emulate uh, upper strings or whatever his um, uh, reasoning was behind it but the the result is really you know eerie and 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 stunning and and i love the way it is you know and then why I, I'm always fascinated when composers are drawn to the double bass and write a piece. Did did he did he know somebody who was a double bassist in his life? Uh, do you have Do you have any? Is there any research or even speculation on like why why the bass for him? Yes, absolutely. So at the time when he lived in Poznan, Poland, he uh, he was a part of uh, of the group of uh, uh, kind of famous musicians and composers and performance performers that included um, a famous Polish pedagogue who goes by the abbreviation ABC, and that stands for for Adam Bronisław Ciechański. That was a uh, that was the uh, direct influence on Kasern to write that concerto because he wrote it for him. And uh, so uh, Chehainsky, I believe, 
played the excerpts of the concerto on Polish radio right before the um, uh, outbreak of the Second World War. It was in 1938, I think, early 1938. And he was definitely the impetus for, for the composer to write that piece. What a what a what an era to be writing a piece. It's a pretty dark time for for humanity. I mean the 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 um I I'll put some clips and people definitely need to go check out on your YouTube channel, but maybe just describe the work and the just the the emotional qualities of this piece. Well, definitely what you're touching upon here is is a big part of it because Kassern was also of uh Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that time and, you know, Poznan, where he was, that's just like one hour from Germany, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously what was happening historically in Germany uh, in early 1930s and throughout with the rise of Hitler and, and all that uh, pressure that resulted in the Second World War was felt around. As a, a Jewish person, he was he was under this enormous pressure, and, and during the war, he actually assumed a different name, and he was being chased by Gestapo all over the place, and and he, you know, part of his uh, uh, emigration to United States was also rooted in that particular um, uh, dramatic situation that he was in. The concerto is. Um, it's extremely emotional. It's it's very melodic, and uh, the orchestra. And by the way, uh, the, there was never a score for that piece for the orchestra. So after I was I, after I premiered this piece in in New York in 2000 uh, uh, American premiere in 2017, there was a, a great effort in Poland uh, by my colleague uh, Donat Zamara, who actually commissioned a score to be sort of uh, built from the piano part. And he gave another premiere, uh, I believe this year, earlier this year, with the orchestra. So the piece throughout all those years, throughout all those 80 years, did not have a, an actual orchestral, or, orchestral uh, score. He, he drafted just the first page of it so you can get some kind of uh, vague idea what kind of instrumentation he was thinking about. And But... I believe the key to this to this piece is the melody, and that the recurring themes um, of it, and it's very chordal. Also, there's all a lot of broken chords and and a lot of very dramatic chordal gestures uh, that are executed by the bass solo. So so nothing uh, else is is heard at that time, and you can hear the the warlike uh, themes from, I would say, early Prokofiev or uh, resembling that, because Kassin was a fabulous, very original uh, uh, composer, and, and his music is deeply rooted in, in actually a, a Polish influence. He was sort of reworking Christmas carols of the traditional, uh, you know, Polish uh, background, and and it's all together, kind of in a Chopinesque, if you will, manner. But I think after playing this piece, what stays with you is this kind of yearning, emotionality of it, and the, the cry, and and just just anguish and. And beauty. It's a very, very beautiful piece. My practicing companion, Modacity, this awesome app, it is so great for getting you to really think about your practicing. And there's what's called a deliberate practice mode. It tracks everything that you are improving upon and time spent in every piece is just so great. Here is founder and CEO of Modacity, Mark Gelfo, on what the app does. I use the deliberate practice feature in Modacity a ton. So what I'm logging my improvements. Oh, I improved my articulation today by using this strategy. And, and then I see that in my log. So I see all the improvements that I made, the strategy that led to that improvement. I see the star rating as well as the time spent. It is so satisfying to be able to look back on your history like Mark's describing. I do that all the time. And it keeps me inspired and energized and feeling like I'm really making progress. Learn more at modacity.co. And if you visit our site, we've got a special offer for lifetime access for this app 
Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. Steve has been active in the bass world and also the guitar world for years. Here's a bit from our live podcast taping with Steve on how he got into that business. Guitars and basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. I love how Steve describes being a support person, and he is certainly that for the bass community here on the West Coast, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. His shop is located just south of San Francisco, and he has a large retail showroom with about 70 basses on display. And these basses are professional top of the line bases. These bases are student level bases and everything in between. They're beautifully set up. So if you're looking for a base or you know someone who is, be sure to check out Steve at steveswanstringbass.com. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, Steve. When I was recently chatting with Gary and Eric of Upton Bass, I asked them, How did they do what they do? How do they build their presence and be so top of mind among bassists around the world? Here's what they said. My ego doesn't want to say this, right? And Eric's won't like it either. But because of the timing, we couldn't do again what we've done. Yeah. And what they have done is absolutely extraordinary from their beginnings as an accessories shop online to now making over 120 bases a year. They're coming up as I record this on 1700 bases. They've got an army of satisfied customers who bought multiple bases. They're just really doing great things. They do great work and stand behind their products. Check them out at uptonbase.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast guys. Yeah, you're you're making me want to learn it. Uh, it, yeah, it does does um, just from a bass player perspective. So it's this lyrical piece and all these broken chords. How how does it sit on the instrument once you've got that baritone tuning on and you're all set up? Uh, is it is it does it lay out well on the bass or is it uh, is it an m- extremely difficult challenge just in terms of how it's how it sits on the bass? It is a challenge in a way that, that you have to apply a little bit different way of thinking. I would say it's more horizontal, it's more long lines, and you have to be able to build the, the tension over, over long stretches of, of the score. But, you know, I love that open A string. And that's mm-hmm. like, this is the, the foundation that he goes back over and over uh, again. Too and and you know you you always rest on that open A and it's like big roaring powerful sound. It's kind of reminds me of the old three string bass where you had really powerful sounding strings because it was less tension on the top of the instrument. But at the same time, you there's a lot of work where you start very low and you go all the way and all the way up and believe it or not i had to have the the three uh, active uh, fingerboard extended fingerboard installed even though i'm starting from the a this is my lowest string i still had to have three actives because it goes so so high so um I would say it, it's it's a well-written piece for double bass there's there's nothing like weird or or unplayable but you have to sort of adjust your, your way of approach to that piece by making it, you know, more horizontal and dramatic and, and lyrical. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by the possibilities that a high C string opens up. I'm sort of scared to play around with it because I'm worried that I'll like it. And, I'll, <laughs> and then I'll be, I'll be messed up when I go play at some other bass. But um, had you done much playing in that baritone tuning before? Uh, not really. No, this was the first time, actually, uh, I, I believe, you know, there's some people who, who like to have a five string bass with an extension and the high C string. So that, that opens, you know, enormous, uh, enormous register to, to all kinds of possibilities and, and also orchestral excerpts that you can realize in the neck position. You don't have to go all the way to, to, to thumb position to play some of those um, difficult spots in that tuning. 
but I think it's it's very interesting. Um, it's a free free uh, free reign. You can you can do whatever you want with that tuning. Yeah, I, w- I was watching a couple of years ago. Uh, Diana Gannett came here and uh, for our base camp, and she was playing. I think viol- a violin partita. Boy, I'm, I'm blanking on what it was, but she's been playing in that baritone tuning. And uh, a friend of mine, Donovan Stokes, does exactly what you're describing with the five string um, and the extension. But he takes it a notch further. He has his top four strings in solo tuning so his high string is a high d string and it's like that it's it's awesome but man if you got to borrow another bass somewhere it's a very specific uh world to live in but yeah it's just wild i remember watching him play these solo passages and he's just down in like second position on the c string you know i'm i'm up in thumb position and it's good did you did you try any other repertoire while you were in that baritone tuning like any other solo repertoire Yes, I actually did try to play one of my compositions, which is which is called Westbeth Capriccio, and you can also see it. I'm doing it with an improvising dancer on my uh, YouTube channel. Um, it's kind of a broad spectrum piece, and uh, yeah, it was fantastic in that tuning because you bring everything a fourth up, and the harmonics are just just magical, you know, and. And all the the slap technique, and it's all much more clear, and and um, uh, there's a lot of projection that you don't uh, experience before uh, doing that tuning. So I think, yeah, it's yeah, I I love experimenting all kinds of. Uh, ways. Me too. You should see this. This my studio back here. I got all sorts of gadgets. I'm trying out. I got. I got. I love geeking out on rosins and end pins. And I think we bass players, you know, that we're 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 prone to do that. I got to ask because actually we 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 uh, started talking about the concerto. But um, you're up to all sorts of things in New York. Like like, could you just go? So so we, so we talked about going and studying with Oren and Tim Cobb and Eugene, and then like n- now what what's a what do you do in a given year? Year, just in terms of ensembles and you're performing with a dancer and then you're writing your own piece and playing at Carnegie Hall and getting things orchestrated. I mean, it's, I love, I love the, the energy of all these different projects. Can you just like talk through like, like what maybe 2019, 2020, or just any given year, what you're, what you've been up to? Yes. Uh, so I love the, yeah, as you're saying, the, the energy of New York city is just incredible. And the variety of the things that we can do and are exposed to is, is, is unmatched. Mm-hmm. So um, I am a member of Orchestra of St. Luke's, which in itself is a very uh, kind of uh, interesting ensemble because we do all kinds of things from early music, you know, and the gut string culture is very, very strong in our group. And we do all that through all the repertoire, the classical repertoire, and then we play, you know, with Paul McCartney or Metallica. So and Miley Cyrus too, and and you know, it, it's just uh, it's just fantastic. So you get all those uh, incredible opportunities. Just over this past weekend, we did a concert of of uh, Star Wars, John Williams is uh, the first um, film episode, which is number four. And that was exhilarating with the big section. And um, I also played with uh, many other orchestras, including Vienna Philharmonic, um, and then New York City Ballet and, and New York City Opera, uh, New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. But I also do uh, a number of film work, which, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, uh, that this kind of work is coming back to the United States. At some point, it was outsourced a little bit uh, to um, other countries, but in a, in a wonderful turn, the, the big film companies are coming back to the States and, and they are starting do, to do recordings in here. So I, um, I recorded a lot of film scores here in New York City, um, I was also uh, a part of on-screen part for several uh, productions, uh, including The Greatest Showman, which is um, which is a fantas- fantastic film. Uh, you know, uh, Hugh Jackman's. Uh, we even got a, an Oscar, I think. No, Golden Globe for the original song, which you know every every kid is singing. <laughs> 
and then I was also in Mozart in the Jungle. You can see me in that uh, in that uh, Amazon series. And there's also a lot of teaching involved. I have a private studio in New York City. Um, I, my, I'm lucky to coach a lot of uh, jazz bassists who, you know, when they have uh, recording projects, they want to brush up on their classical chops and technique and, and the bowing especially. So I get a chance to, to work with them. And um, I also taught at uh, New York University, Rutgers University, and uh, Hartwick College on Ionta, New York. So there's a, really a lot of things uh, happening at the same time. And I try to keep composing as much as I can. Right now I'm uh, in the process of writing a, a cycle of love songs uh, for voice and double bass. And this is based on Armenian uh, folk songs. Uh, you know, I was I was uh, performing uh, some music by Komitas, which is a national hero for musicians in, in Armenia. He actually uh, compiled a lot of their folk music and, and, and amazing material and made it uh, available for you know, in a, in a modern notation for everybody. So I'm going to be writing uh, three love songs for, for voice and double bass based on that. Um, and that's going to premiere in February of 2020, this coming, uh, uh, this coming Valentine's season. <laughs> yeah. but, but definitely, there's a lot of uh, different things happening all the time. Wow, that's that's awesome, and I love. So I got to go. Uh, I, I get Amazon videos. So I'm going to go track you down on Mozart in the Jungle. That's fantastic. That's you fantastic. See, yeah, you, you can you can see me in the tenth episode of the first season. Okay. There's a scene where the uh, the violin soloist is throwing a big uh, argument, and and she has a fit, and and the orchestra is sitting through it, and it's very it's very entertaining actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that show because even though we we know as musicians we're like it's not it's not that's not exactly how it goes you know in terms of like the way the work is uh, my my wife's a doctor and we talk a lot about like medical shows and I think that there's a big parallel to that it's like if you watch ER or Grey's Anatomy or anything that's also not how doctor life is you know it, but it's heightened heightened drama but I did I lo I love that I love that series and even from the very first episode where the student the students forgetting to pay the teacher the teacher Teachers asking for their sixty bucks or whatever, and that's uh, that's that's very cool. Um, I. I and I love that you're that you continue to compose, and I'm always fascinated uh, by. I don't I don't the only composing I do is like easy bass arrangements for for various things. But do you is that a regular practice for you? Do you try to write regularly, like weekly or daily, or is it just you have a project coming up and you get inspired and you start doing it? Uh, how does composing fit into your life? Well, for me, it always comes from the inspiration part. Mm -hmm. I'm not like waking up every day at 4 a.m. and starting to scribble down things. Uh, it's uh, it, it always comes from some kind of emotion or something that I experience or something that I really feel like I, I have something to say, and then I'm trying to uh, to work it into the the idiom of double bass or whatever I'm writing for. So in this particular uh, case of the of the love songs, it's it's an outcome of of working on that music and being fascinated by the melisma of it and and just just the beauty of it. Uh, but yeah, sometimes I do arrangements as well. If I do some kind of educational outreach for for students, uh, and I'm trying to engage them with uh, with a little arrangement of you know even Britney Spears toxic. You know that that sounds very cool on on the bass quartet, believe it or not. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so so in my case, it uh, it always is is an inspiration of some sort. A few years ago, um, you know, there was a, a pride parade in New York City, and we actually um, uh, uh, I was walking there, and and I saw after after the parade there was a lot of cleanup you know all the confetti and and whatnot and there were guys with uh, um, like uh, leaf blower vacuum cleaners and all that in a backpack form and and that sound of those roaring leaf blowers in the concrete jungle of new york city 
that was creating the very magical sound of like uh, Tibetan trumpets. Something th- you, you don't hear that kind of thing every day. And I thought, what an amazing sound. So I wrote this piece called New York Requiem, and it's scored for four leaf blowers and a conductor. So it, there's always some kind of twist to it, you know. In, in, in my case, the, some event or something, some feeling or, or you know, to I, answer your question. Oh, no, I love, I love finding the, the artistry and the poetry and the, mu- the musicality of just, like, daily life. I think about that a lot. I, I've, I have yet to write – I have not written a piece for four leaf blowers and conductor. But I do – I do even if it's – whether it's photography or thinking about uh, an arrangement or something I want to write about, I get so inspired just walking around here, too. And it's never w- – when I – who you probably weren't expecting to uh, hear the musicality from, from the, the post-Pride Parade cleanup. But that's – that's awesome. I love it. And Sorry. <laughs> no, just... no, it's it's very cool. And and it's 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 just always interesting to me for people who are engaged, you know, c- creating something, you know, whether it's it's music or or writing or 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 you name it, like h- how that process works for them. And I think most people I've talked to, because I've asked that question of a lot of people, uh, most people write like you do. It's like the inspiration, and then they go in, they they go in a burst. Uh, I remember, you know, f- talking to Frank Proto about this years ago and it was the same thing but there are a few people um that do make it like this daily practice there's this uh, australian composer and bassist named erica brahman who i talked to recently and she's done these multi she was she was on a uh, streak of trying to write a short song every single day and have one element i hope i hope it's erica i was talking apologies erica if i get this wrong but but and then try to have some element uh, from the previous day incorporated into the next day's song. Just as like a creative exercise. And I thought, how cool is that? I, I haven't started doing that, but it's, uh, I love, I, I just love how, how people put different things together to, you know, create their art. Yes, everybody's different. And, and I think that's wonderful that we are, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, uh, well, this is so. Let's not have this be a one, a one, one and done thing. I'd love to have you back and talk. Whatever your next project is, or next time in New York City, maybe we could get together and have a round two chat in person. I'm talking to somebody in a few weeks. I think this will be his fifth time on the podcast. So let's uh, keep keep the door open, and I'd I'd love to I'd love to chat some more. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I just got a brand new bass and I think I'm going to bring it to the ISB at some point, maybe playing the concerto. So you will hear the baritone tuning. Firsthand. Oh, that would be a that would be a great thing for ISB. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to, to that or what, whatever's next for you. So bye. Bye bye. Thanks again, Pavel. I really appreciate chatting with you and learning more about Tadeusz. And folks, check out the show notes for this episode if you want to learn more about this very cool composer. Listen to Pavel's complete performance and his documentary and some of Pavel's other music as well. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I really appreciate having you along with me on this journey as we get well into the 600s for this show. It's really been fun to do. And every once in a while, I put out a call for help or some sort of request at the ends of these episodes. I don't put this out on social media. Just put it here in the podcast. And I'm doing that right now. We are working at Contrabass Conversations on the blog, we're working on a sheet music project. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Trevor Jones, who's along for the ride on this project, is kind of spearheading this project, actually. We're very excited, but we're looking for somebody who has some copyist skills, who has some finale or Sibelius skills, who wants to roll up and get their hands dirty and is really into nitty gritty and details on parts. This wouldn't be a volunteer thing. This would be paid in some capacity. We can chat more about that. But every time I've put one of these calls for help out or calls for people to get in touch or whatever you want to call this, I've had great responses. So I'm just asking if anybody is interested in getting involved behind the scenes here and wants to work on some 
projects with us and do some copying work and we could talk more about that that'd be that'd be fine uh feedback at contrabaseconversations.com will put you in touch with me and let's chat Contra Race Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And Mitch is making beautiful bases, award-winning bases, and has a new space in downtown Kilgore, Texas. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. And thank you so much to Krista Copper for archiving and categorizing everything we talk about in this podcast. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 